Hi everyone and welcome to uh, our first introductory video on sexual ethics in Christianity. In this unit we're going to be looking at four main issues and those being uh, premarital and extramarital sex, homosexuality and gender roles and discrimination. But before we begin unpacking these issues individually and start to consider how they have been considered in relation to ethics in Christianity, Let's just take the time to step back for a second and remind ourselves what it is we're talking about when we're talking about ethics and when we're considering ethics. Essentially, ethics are, you know, moral principles that govern behavior. They define what is right and what is wrong or what should and shouldn't be done. So when we're discussing these issues in relation to ethics, we're discussing whether they are perceived in Christianity to be allowed or forbidden. Now, the first thing that you might think of is, of course, the role of the Bible in helping people try and understand ethics and what is ethical behavior. In fact, your mind might jump to something like the Ten Commandments, where we have direct and specific instructions on ten things that we should and shouldn't do, thou shalt and thou shalt not. And definitely, scripture plays a huge role in codifying ethics, providing uh, information to an adherent to give them uh, an understanding of what God would want them to do and stay away from. Yet, despite the fact that we have the Ten Commandments and we have, you know, sacred texts, we have the Holy Bible, what we need to remember is that, or what you'll soon uncover throughout this course, is there isn't exactly a uniform Christian opinion for all people and across all denominations about sexual ethics in terms of the issues that we're going to be discussing. For we have to remind ourselves um, that while the Bible is a very direct and seems very specific in some instances in telling us what is allowed and forbidden according to the will of God, we have to remind ourselves that this is actually a long and ancient complex text which adherents and churches interpret differently over time and according to their own understanding and conscience. How passages are interpreted or which sermons or texts are emphasized, for example, if you focus on the Old Testament or the New Testament, actually has direct implications on people's beliefs on what is right and what is wrong. So it's not always clear-cut leading to one particular viewpoint it will become apparent to you that things can get quite murky when we are looking at ethics. All right, now with that disclaimer aside for a second, let's begin by looking at our first issue. So let's look at premarital sex, which is essentially sex before marriage. So our question is, according to Christianity, and thus according to the Bible, is premarital sex right or wrong? How is it looked at ethically speaking? Well, interestingly, premarital sex is not addressed directly in Christian scripture. This might seem strange when you consider the emphasis placed on waiting for marriage for young people by most churches. But it might not be so strange when we remember that most people in biblical times were married just after they hit puberty. So perhaps for this reason, it might not be an issue that would have been directly the focus of scripture. Uh, it seems more to be relevant to our modern world, the post-industrial world, because before the 16th and 17th century, children were actually represented as mini adults. And the idea of childhood that we have today and the role of the teenage years in forming identity is sort of didn't really exist in the same way. And children were seen to be adults pretty much at the dawn of puberty. So the second that you had uh, um, uh, biological instincts towards sex, or the second you were really able to reproduce, you were to be considered for marriage. Now, you can sort of understand why this happened, but... Uh, we also have to look at uh, passages in the Bible that talk about uh, sex before marriage. It's, and the way it is 
sort of treated. So have a look at Exodus 22.16 that states, If a man seduces a virgin who is not pledged to be married and sleeps with her, he must pay the bride price and she shall be his wife. So sex before marriage is sort of not an issue in and of itself, but it's sort of marriage is considered an important part of sex because otherwise things can get quite complex. The basic idea is that God created sex for procreation, to make babies. And you need to be married in order to make a baby because that system ensured or safeguarded that uh, a man's heirs and his property from being jeopardized in a time where paternity tests, of course, didn't exist. Uh, that's why we have a more focus on uh, the virginity of the woman uh, in the Bible than necessarily the virginity of the man. And it's very much the attention is directed to women making sure that they are virgins or at least that they are uh, not lying to men about their virginity because this could really complicate the issue of the family in biblical times. All right, so despite the fact that modern life has changed and we now no longer consider it ethical to have sex at, uh, to be married at uh, age 12 or just at the dawn of puberty, and now we have a much longer period where premarital sex is a, a sort of a greater concern, the ideal has remained in Christianity that a Christian couple will remain virgins unto marriage, their husband or wife being their first and last sexual partner. All right, let's have a look at extramarital sex and how it is sort of treated in the Bible. And it's quite a different story here. We actually have quite direct uh, uh, mention of extramarital sex, and it is attacked quite dramatically um, in the Bible in some instances. The first thing that might pop into your mind is the fact that adultery is actually considered in the Ten Commandments. We have thou shalt not commit adultery, often referenced as one of the commandments, but if we sort of look at some other uh, fuller translations of, of this commandment, it states thou shalt not covet your neighbor's wife or desire their house, field, male servants. So what actually seems to be happening here is not actually talking about extramarital sex necessarily, but having sex with someone else's wife because it's a direct violation against another man's property. Okay. Uh, for example, when we look at what is the punishment of extramarital sex, it's actually quite severe. A, uh, someone who commits adultery uh, could be put to death. That's the adulterer and the adulteress, so both people involved. But what is actually quite interesting is that while this conviction sort of reminds us of how unethical adultery is seen to be in the Bible, we also have to remember that the death penalty is actually not the punishment when adultery is committed with an unmarried woman. So it seems that the woman being married or, or linked to some other man or some other man's property is really the issue here and not necessarily the sex that someone is having outside of the marriage, though it might still very well be considered unethical, not perhaps to the same level uh, to warrant the same type of punishment. Uh, for example, there are a few stories within the Bible or the biblical narrative where we have examples of extramarital sex which actually don't lead to punishment and sort of are looked at favorably in the Bible. So one example is of course Abraham here who uh, marries Sarah, uh, who marries um, uh, Sarah and then of course later Hajar, her uh, handmaiden, we might say, okay, miss, that might not necessarily count because he's technically married to two women. So if he has sex with both of them or sexual relationships with both of them, it's not adultery. But actually the line's going to be blurred here because technically uh, Hajar isn't uh, a wife. She's a pilgesh, which is basically a more than an, uh, a casual sexual partner, but less than a wife, something that we might call a concubine now. But there are other stories elsewhere in which uh, sex outside of the marriage occurs. We have the story of Jacob, Rachel, Leah, and Bilhah in Genesis 29. 
basically the story goes that Jacob over here goes to uh, find his uncle and in the meantime he finds the beautiful Rachel which he gets smitten with, the younger daughter of his uncle. He goes to his uncle and basically uh, works for his uncle for seven years under the agreement that he will get Rachel as his lawfully wedded wife and he can then sleep with her. But his uncle does a bit of a, a, a trick on him and actually gives him Leah, his older daughter, and he realizes the next morning that he's sort of been tricked, but he's already uh, married and consummated his marriage. So he works for another seven years and actually then has Leah. So again, you might be saying, well, Miss, that's actually, you know, to uh, that sex within a marriage, right? Two people, two wives, essentially. But what then happens is that Rachel actually is ends up being barren or not being able to have children. So she gives her uh, husband, Jacob, her handmaiden, which seems to be a reoccurring biblical narrative, Bilhah, and she actually conceives his children and then Rachel sort of rears them as her own. Now, this is obviously extramarital sex because he's having sex with someone outside of his marriage, but in this context is considered ethical because basically it's helping Rachel and Jacob fulfill the commandment to multiply and have children. So in the, the waters definitely do get blurry here uh, and it can become quite complicated on how a someone should view extramarital sex. But uh, like I said even before, it is mainly the focus on, on women um, and of course the idea that women tempt men just like Adam tempted Eve and therefore women sort of get attacked more as adulteresses than men uh, might do unless of course the man uh, has extramarital affairs with unmarried woman that belongs to another man. Then it's a bit of a different story. But okay. Uh, now let's have a look at um, homosexuality and the way that it is approached in the Bible. Now what we might remember is that there is this constant theme that basically sexual intercourse is designed by God to be or, or to create children for procreation. Now the goal is to be fruitful and multiply and if someone chooses a sexual partner which that cannot biologically happen, so they have a same-sex relationship, they are basically not fulfilling this commandment for God. Now, this is, of course, then assumes that homosexuality, uh, homosexuality is unethical. Basically, sex was created to merge two people for procreation. Eve came out of Adam's rib. They were one body divided into two flesh. And when they come together, they merge as one again. So the idea is this is how it should be properly done. So if it is not done in this way, then it might be the incorrect way. But the Bible goes further and actually talks about same-sex relationships as an abomination. Thou shalt not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. So that's in Leviticus 18.22. But uh, another big uh, thing that people point to and that the church points to when they criticize homosexuality and consider it as an unethical relationship is the story of the fall of Sodom. Basically, Sodom is a city in biblical in the biblical narrative that gets destroyed by fire by God after its people were really sinful and were committing all acts against nature that God would have dis disapproved on. But basically, uh, how it's related to the issue of, of homosexuality is basically because of Lot, who... Um, in, by the way, this is where we get the word sodomy from as well, but Lot basically gets attacked by um, the city folk who try to rape him. He offers his virgin daughters, but they refuse, and this is sort of considered to be the ultimate breach of hospitality, and therefore God burns down the city and uh, smites it, so to speak. And people who often reference this and say, well, this is obviously says that... Um, uh, homosexuality is such an abomination that it required God's intervention, but some others focus on the fact that it was actually rape which was considered to be the, the issue and to be um, 
the the sinful act and not necessarily homosexuality uh, specifically. But in any case, the city gets uh, destroyed and people will say, well, the the uh, representation goes as, 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 as follows. Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom, pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. They were haughty and committed abomination before me. Therefore, I took them away as I saw good. So some people will say that it's not actually uh, homosexuality which would have uh, is directly referenced here. It can be a little bit vague and people will say that it's not uh, necessarily uh, um, homosexual relationships here. It's more uh, um, you know, sexual depravity in general and sin in general which cause the destruction of this city. Okay, in fact, there are actually relationships between men in the Bible that can be interpreted as, as romantic, although the question of whether they're sexual is a bit up in the air and up to interpretation. There's the story of King David and Jonathan, which were basically two rivals for the throne, who ended up having such a meaningful and loving relationship that actually David is said to have said, and it comes to pass when he had made the end of speaking unto Saul that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David and that Jonathan loved him as his own soul. So there's, a, you know, two souls knitting together seems like this sort of narrative that happens between a man and a woman. And further it is said, I am distressed for thee, my brother Jonathan. Very pleasant hast thou been unto me. Thy love to me was wonderful, passing the love of women. Some people interpret this as quite a, a, a strong voice for a, hetero, uh, a homosexual relationship. Others say it was a loving companionship and not necessarily sexual. So two different opinions on this story that have really strong implications for how we can look at uh, homosexuality. Interestingly enough, David is obviously a big uh, hero in the biblical narrative and is looked upon as, as favoured by God. So the fact that he would have this relationship is quite interesting and quite significant. Another image of them two together in a tapestry. And now let's have a, a bit of a look at what the Bible says about gender roles and discrimination. Now, we have uh, quite often a, a mention of the submissiveness and the, um, the second-rate importance of women uh, in the eyes of God. So it says, For a man ought to not have his head covered, since he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of man. For man does not originate from women, but women from men. So basically this follows the idea is how women should be treated and seen and how they should be looked at in society derives from the fact that essentially uh, women came out of the rib of Adam. Now this is interesting though because this narrative of women of um, Eve being created from Adam and thus being sort of um, submissive to Adam um, it contrasts again from another story that exists in biblical times where God made them both equally from clay. Um, but anyway, that story in Genesis 2.18 is really the cornerstone for how people have presented uh, the relationship between man and women in the hierarchy of, of social order for a really long time. Um, and it's also the idea that, you know, women are weaker, women are by, by nature sort of more um, uh, susceptible to, to, to failure and to um, uh, temptation. Of course, we have the, the very famous story of uh, Adam and Eve and how Adam uh, tries to resist taking the fruit, but really it is Eve that convinces him and causes the downfall for both of them and getting them expelled out of paradise. And I particularly like this um, painting because Adam is like trying to stop Eve, but Eve is sort of intent. And this is basically sums up a lot of ideas in the Christian mindset that women are sort of temper temptresses and are sort of sexual in nature and that it is man who is superior and sort of has to control her. 
um, which, you know, flows through in many different ways. Um, but yet there are other, uh, there, are, there are these sort of a re, um, reinforcing this idea of their submissiveness. And sometimes even in church and as Christians, they are said to, you know, be silent in church. But then there are other mentions where it says in baptism there is neither man or woman. So in the eyes of God, you know, God does not perceive man or woman as different. They are both the children of God. So some instances that focus on very deliberately putting women in a different place uh, under man and then other instances where there's a, a more of a projection of equality between the sexes. This has led to things like feminist theology, where people have really focused their time on going back and looking at how women are represented in the Bible and in the biblical narratives and how this actually has a direct impact on uh, culture and how women are treated and uh, how they are expected to act and how they are allowed to uh, participate in religion. For example, feminist theologians will often look at something like why God is represented um, as a male or why we use masculine pronouns when we talk about God and what effect this actually has on gender roles and equality um, in the modern world or really throughout history. So this was where we're going to stop. I just uh, wanted to touch briefly on different points in relation to these ethical issues, how the Bible might uh, be read in relation to these issues and how people might perceive them and where the differences of opinion might sort of come from. What I want you to take away from this lesson is a few brief things. Number one, ideas about sexual ethics are based in scripture and the Bible for Christians is where people turn to to justify their opinions and beliefs on what they think should and shouldn't be allowed to happen. The second thing I want you to remember is that different churches equal different views. So there is not a uniform Christian opinion and it's not just different denominations. So there are hundreds in Christianity with quite different views. We also have to remember that it's up to different individuals as well because a lot of people have a very personal relationship with the Bible and might interpret things in their own light and come to their own determinations or their own conclusions. And the third thing I want you to think about is that modern life leads to new views and challenges. So we live in a very different world than uh, people lived in biblical times. And how does this change of context, change of ideas, technology, belief systems, how does that impact how we look at uh, the Bible, how we look at ethics, and how we try and understand uh, moral behavior uh, as an adherent in the 21st century. Okay, guys, thank you for joining me. Uh, have Feel free to go over this lesson and check back with uh, any parts that you feel like you've missed or you need more time to cover. But like I said, we will be looking at this in greater detail in class. Look forward to seeing you then.